welcome to Grapple Arts Radio. Hi everybody. Today I've got Burton Richardson on the line. Now, I've known of Burton for years and years because I remember reading his articles in Black Belt Magazine and Inside Kung Fu and all those older magazines about Jeet Kune Do. And at the time, I was training a lot in Jeet Kune Do. I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by all the sub-arts within that group of people, the, the Kali, the, uh, the Jun Fan, the Indonesian martial arts. And wherever you looked, Burton was always in those magazines showing really cool techniques. But since that time, Burton's really evolved his game and evolved his whole philosophy towards the martial arts. And I'm super stoked to have him on the line today where he's coming to us from Hawaii and he's going to, we're going to pick his brain and see what he's been up to. So, Burton, how are you doing? Oh, I'm well as always. <laughs> I, I figure if I wake up breathing, it's a good day. And yes, it's another good day. Well, that's awesome. Uh, you just got back from class, eh? Actually, I had guys come over. We were rolling in the, uh, in the carport out here. Nice, beautiful day in Hawaii. And we roll, put the mats out and have a good time with a nice two-hour session. Uh, so got a lot done. And, yeah, it's that wonderful uh, post-roll kind of your whole body is buzzing. And <laughs> so we had a great time. Another day in paradise. Exactly. Well, what, can you take us quickly through your martial arts journey from beginning to end? And maybe I'll jump in and, uh, and ask questions as we go along. But can you take us from the beginning? Why, why did you ever start swinging sticks at people or rolling around on the ground with men wearing spandex? Yes, tried to wait, stay away from the spandex guys, but <laughs> it did happen occasionally. <laughs> so... Uh, Basically, I grew up in a place called Carson, California, which is a neighboring city to Compton, California. And I spent a lot of time uh, in my childhood. I played baseball. And in my early teens, I spent a lot of time in Compton playing ball, where I was the only uh, non-African-American guy in the entire league. And uh, also in Carson, there's a very diverse, um, diverse racially and so what happens is you get that 5% of the population that are bad. And I just saw violence growing up and, you know, guns being shot toward me and this whole thing. And so, you know, basically, I think growing up in that environment, naturally, you are drawn toward, you know, how am I going to defend myself? And I was at a local park, a park where I first saw shooting when I was about 10 years old. And not long after that, at the gymnasium, I was walking by and I heard this, this sound emanating from the gym. It was like this huh, huh, huh sound. And there I am, this little guy, and I peeked in and there were probably a hundred people in geese throwing reverse punches. They're in lines or stances. Huh, huh, huh. And, you know, for a young guy, I was just fascinated. It was just amazing. And uh, but my dad uh, wanted me to play baseball. And so he said, no, you're playing baseball, none of that. And so that probably helped pique my interest, <laughs> the fact right. that I didn't do it. <laughs> the the <laughs> forbidden know. fruit. That's right. <laughs> and then some years later, actually, interesting enough, in that exact same park before a practice, uh, some guys had a magazine, and it was these pictures of this, this uh Chinese guy, and he is like unbelievable physique, and you know? I was from a movie called Enter the Dragon. And so they were telling me about this guy, Bruce Lee, and this and that, and many, some years later when I was uh, 17, actually my very first girlfriend, our very first date, she came to, I was a little, I was a nerd, all right? So <laughs> she came to my house and asked me if I wanted to go to the movie, so I'm like, okay, and she took me to Enter the Dragon. How's that? <laughs> Perfect. She, yes. And she was training at the college. She's a keeper. The, yeah, she, she, <laughs> for a while. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she's great. But, uh, yeah, she happened to be training at the Filipino Kali Academy with Dan Inasano and Richard Basillo, and she took me over there. And, you know, I got to watch a class, and that was pretty much it. I was just hooked. And, you know, it was 
you saw these guys, uh, everybody in sweatpants and a T-shirt. It's very much like a baseball athletic environment. And they're hitting mitts and they're kicking kicking shields and then they're sparring and some guy got a bloody nose in front of me and I thought that was just fabulous. And then a little bit later they pulled out the weaponry and they started moving and it was just, I don't know. It just, I was just hooked. That was it all over. (laughs) So uh, it was, yeah, it just lit a fire that's still burning. So you were then associated with Dan and Santo for years and years. Yes. Um, and just so to be clear, he, he's coming here to visit me in a few months, uh, doing a seminar over here for me. Every few years I have him over for a seminar and I'm in contact with him very often. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, dog brother group that I'm uh, associated with, uh, like this uh, heavy. Right. You're, you're going to have to uh, break that down for the, the listenership. What on earth are, are these dog brothers? Yeah, what, what is that thing? Okay, I'll give you the brief thing. Basically, it was at the Inasano Academy late at night uh, in the mid-'80s. A guy, one of the guys training there named Mark Benny, actually I was he was a student of mine. I'd teach him sea lot, like private lessons in Indonesian sea lot, amongst other things, and he was a uh, one of the senior students at the academy. And one night he came up to me and said, hey, you know, you like actually stick sparring, because I would actually go to tournaments, um, and compete in stick fighting. And it would be, you know, a lot of big headgear. You'd have all this, like a giant suit on, so you're protected. Very, very thin light sticks, big gloves, the whole thing, knee protection, all the deal. And this, he said, this friend of mine, he likes uh, stick fighting as somebody he met recently. And he was, well, you want to spar with him? And of course, yeah, sure. So he, this guy comes down, he's really big, his name's Eric Noss. And big, tall guy, strong. Make a long story short, he takes a big, very big, heavy rattan stick. And he goes, do you mind if we use these? I'm like, no, that's fine. So we put on a helmet. We, we only have helmet, hand protection, I think maybe knee, maybe not knee pads, just that. That's all. And I figure because we have no protection, we're going to go really, really light, especially because these sticks are so big and heavy because, you know, gosh, you could kill somebody with those things. So we start and he just tries to take my head off, like hit, like swing so incredibly hard to try to take my head off. And I found out that night that although I could block his shots, I just had nothing going under that kind of pressure, that kind of fear of actually getting your knee blown out or arm broken or knocked out, whatever it was, I just didn't have anything actually there, even though I was an instructor and supposedly really good at this art. So that started a big evolution. And I just want to, uh, maybe we'll talk about that a little more later, but the idea of, you know, you go in and you try it out. Cause this guy, Eric, who was just an amazing stick fighter, His question, after doing Filipino martial arts for years and years and years, his question, which is brilliant, was, hey, what actually happens when guys really fight for real and hit as hard as they can, especially with not much protection so you're afraid of getting hit? What actually happens then? So he went and tested it like a scientist. And whereas I had been doing, you know, drills and drills and drills and cool techniques and pressing everybody and all that, but... That was more reality. So that helped really change my focus. Now, so the, it was will, the pressure, it was a, the element of pressure that was added and the element of, of fear, I suppose, as well, that showed you that you needed to train a different way, that showed you needed to test it a different way? Well, at the time, what happened after that first night, yeah, I just literally, my mind was racing the whole way, drive home, the night, the, I just... It just did not compute. I had been doing Filipino martial arts for many, many years, and I had a real reputation as being this very, very good practitioner of it. And, you know, you go from this environment where you think everything you know you can do. You can do this. I can do everything. And then you get to this thing where, like, whoa, I couldn't do. Only thing I could do is block and then when he tried to smash me in the knee, I was able to move my leg out of the way. And that was, you know, fortunately I had done enough sparring of going just the hand and the head with, 
you know, just hitting at the hand or hitting at the, I'm sorry, at the leg. I practiced that moving at the leg, so I had some good defense there. So luckily I didn't get beat and beaten up, but, you know, I just was lost, basically. I was just totally defensive and uh, just deer, you know, deer in the headlights sort of feeling. So what over the years what I found out is, you know, you just have to, the first thing is you have to be able to function under that kind of pressure. You can know techniques. I mean, it's jujitsu, looking at jujitsu, which I love, of course. I spent, I don't know, last coming up on 20 years here doing jujitsu. It's one thing to do jujitsu. When you add striking in, especially hard striking, when guys are really trying to hit you hard and you don't have protection, it's a whole other thing because now there's not the fear of losing or getting your guard passed or getting submitted. There's the fear of physical damage. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole nother level. So that, that stick fighting really helped me to one, be calm under pressure. And I got to say all the times I did that, I did it for many years and I never once wanted to go do it. When it's like, oh, yeah, Eric's coming tonight. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> right. But I just, I don't know, something, I'm ha- luckily, happily, whatever, something inside me just compels me. I have to go try. I can't, yeah, I just had to go do it. And uh, I'm glad I did. Well, it's funny because I've, one of my defining memories is watching a couple of guys who'd been doing a lot of traditional martial arts spar full contact for the first time, not, not with sticks, just with uh, mm-hmm. boxing gloves. And the traditional martial arts stance lasted for about three seconds until the first guy got hit in the face. And you know, within five seconds, it had degenerated to two guys standing with their hands down at their waists, throwing these gigantic right-handed <laughs> haymakers over and over. Forget, forget both hands, forget the, you know, the leaping monkey fist steals the peaches or whatever it was. It was just right hand to to face straight, you know, with a straight arm thrown like a baseball from 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 behind the guy's body and trading back and forth. And I was sitting there. Uh, I had done a little bit of sparring, uh, full contact sparring at the time. So, you know, I, I would have I was sitting there finding this pretty amusing. But, you know, uh-huh. you put anybody under enough pressure, they, they, they go back to the, the primal instincts. You know, we're not, we're not that much evolved from, from cavemen. It is true. But, you know, that is, like uh, Bruce Lee talked about, the truth in combat. That's the truth in combat. Once you get hit really hard, okay, now we're talking about the truth in combat. And when we talk about discipline in the martial arts, you know, oh, sometimes people have this, um, this separation. I think you're a good example of somebody, Stefan, that doesn't do this because uh, you have the whole picture. But, you know, there are a lot of people that separate. It's like, oh, this is fighting and that's martial arts. And sometimes we forget that the uh, – or people forget some of those attributes, those things we look for in traditional martial arts like discipline and such are, is so important – to really look for that in actually our reality-based like actual fighting. For example, you get hit in the face like you're talking, you know, everybody goes back to that big haymaker thing until they have developed the discipline to respond well, even when they're under that pressure. So to me, that's the way it's all about it. our training is if we can develop ourselves so under that kind of pressure, we can be calm and we can actually implement a really well thought out directive game plan. And we take that in our everyday life and do the same thing because it's easy to be calm every day when everything's great. When things start going wrong, that's when we have to draw from our martial arts training and all that pressure we've been under and say, no, it's best to just be calm and do the right thing here. Don't go off the handle. Don't, you know, follow the handle and go start screaming or whatever. I just think that's probably the most important thing we can learn out of real martial arts. Well, I think that's a really good point, Burton. Uh, I do want to move on to jiu-jitsu and grappling and MMA. But before I do that, uh, I want to play the devil's advocate for a second with the uh, the Dog Brothers self. 
in the sparring where you're wearing the fencing, minimal protection and heavy sticks. The argument's been made that that teaches you bad habits for when it would come to bladed weaponry because, uh, you know, when I've done the Dog Brothers style sparring, you're sometimes willing to take a shot or two if you know you can get a good one in or if you can charge into the clinch. The, the naysayers say, well, you're just training yourself to get your arm chopped off if, if we had mach machetes or swords or bladed weaponry. Uh, so how do, you, um, how do you square that circle that uh, you know, blades versus not blades and that you're going to develop bad pattern or bad habits uh, right. when you're going between those two weapons systems? Exactly. So the, to me, the key question is what are we training for? What, is, what are we training for? If I'm training to go in a sword fight, which chances are I'm not going to get a, in a sword fight, sword against sword fight. Probably not. Then people <laughs> also say, well, you're never going to get in a stick fight. But I saw a stick fight in L.A. one time living in downtown L.A. I saw two guys with uh, blunt implements, and they were swinging at each other, just like you were talking about that caveman sort of thing. They are both just swinging like crazy, and either one of them knew how to actually use a stick they would have got, they would have been fine. But as far as that thing goes, I think uh, one thing with the helmets are there are certain techniques that do not work with that helmet, even if it's a light helmet. You have to hit really hard, generate lots of power to knock somebody out when that helmet's on, whereas a quick jab without the helmet will still get the stunning effect, and then you can follow up. So there, are, anytime you add um, uh, protective equipment, it changes the way you can act, you're going to actually implement it. Like in MMA with the, the gloves, put the gloves on, and wow, that getting to the choke is a different thing. You, you just, mm -hmm. guys can grab onto your glove, and it's, uh, uh, I mean, when I was, I trained uh, Chris Lieben for three years. I was his head coach for three years. He just moved to San Diego. And um, we worked against that all the time, getting that choke. I mean, he would reach in and grab the glove, and you know, the <laughs> referee doesn't see it. It's okay. And then we would practice trying to get techniques where we don't. So the point being, you add the equipment, it changes everything. Now, as far as blades go, you tend not to enter with the blade unless there's a very particular way. I spent uh, quite a bit of time training with a man in the Philippines who was the greatest living grandmaster and all. But he actually did, imagine MMA. Okay, all you MMA guys out there, which I love MMA, you step into that cage, man, that takes courage, right? Because that guy is going to try to elbow you. He's going to try to punch you in the face with those wrapped hands on those little gloves. He's going to knee in the face, kick you, the whole thing. I mean, that is a tough sport. This guy I trained with, he had two matches, which were sword fights with no armor. Actually go in a ring with a sword, fight another guy that has a sword. So you can imagine what kind of confidence this guy who, had. Who was he? His name was uh, Antonio Illustrissimo, Tatang yeah. Illustrissimo. Just an uh, amazing, amazing dude. Obviously, he won those matches. But um, he, uh, yes, he was a, it was a sword fighting system. That was his system. And it's, there are a lot of particular details that are very different than when you're going stick fighting. You try to stay long range. And, you know, it's just like you look at Anderson Silva, for example, in MMA. You see his ability to strike from the outside, right? I mean, it's just amazing, his ability. If you put a knife in Anderson Silva's hand, oh, God, it would just be horrible because he is so good on the outside. Well, that's how blade fighters tend to be very good on the outside. And if they have to enter, then it's a very quick entry with control of the, the opponent's blade so that, you know, they're not getting it. But, uh, yeah, so there's to answer the question – Huge difference between heavy contact stick fighting and sword fighting. There's no doubt. Okay. Well, let's, let's move the conversation into more familiar ground for most people, which is the, uh, the grappling end of things. So you, you've been doing jiu-jitsu, I'm assuming Brazilian jiu-jitsu, for 20 years. Who did you start with? I started with the Machado Brothers. I was actually uh, uh, choreographing a movie. <laughs> the famous kickboxer four movie. And, uh, I asked Higgin Machado and John Machado to come and be in it as you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guys. And so that's why I really got to know them and, and all. And then I went to take a lesson 
Uh, actually, my first lesson actually was with Hicks and Gracie, my very first lesson. Uh, one of my private students that I was training in kickboxing, he said, hey, I'm training with this guy, you should go. So I went, and it was like, wow, it was amazing. Um, but at that time, I still, my mind wasn't open yet to it, truthfully. And I could tell you all kinds of stuff. But the truth was, <laughs> my mind wasn't open to it mm-hmm. at that time. And then uh, a little later, it was maybe two years later, I started with the Machado, and yeah, again, I just went out a little bit and uh, did a seminar in Hawaii here. I taught a seminar here in Hawaii, and a guy named Egan Inoue came to the seminar, and uh, I got to be really good friends with him, so I'd fly over and train him in kickboxing and such, and he trained me in jiu-jitsu. Is this uh, when he was fighting in Pride? This was before any of that. Yeah, he, he had actually quit because of the jiu-jitsu politics. Okay. Um, yeah, because yeah, he, he, had, he had done well. He won a bunch of, as a blue belt, won a bunch of tournaments over here. And then there's, yeah, there's this whole thing that happens in jiu-jitsu. Wait, where, wait a second. There, there are politics, jiu-jitsu politics in Hawaii as well? I... Uh, I think it's the only place that has it, isn't it? Oh, okay. Okay, glad to yeah, hear it. I don't, yeah, I don't think it happens any place else. So. Okay, cool. Okay, so 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 there you got you're there with Egan. <laughs> yeah, and so anyway, I started training with Egan and the Machados at the same time, and what I found out it's funny it's the same thing like the stick fighting. But the Machados they figured uh, you know I was this guy that's already on covers of magazines and all this sort of thing, so I didn't know any better. So each time I trained with them, I took private lessons because I didn't at the time the classes were as I was teaching classes. I took these privates, and so what they did is they showed me some techniques and this and that, and they never had me roll for, uh, geez, like maybe eight months or a year or something. I'm taking these private lessons and never actually rolling. Then I go to Egan's place, and he says, he goes, well, uh, here, let's roll first just to see how it is. (laughs) He had this horrified look on his face after I rolled for like 30 seconds. He's like horrified because it's like, oh, my gosh, he doesn't know anything. And uh, and let's just say I was not, I had no attributes for ground fighting whatsoever, just totally fish out of water. But um, I just, you know, put my time in. That's just was my thing. I was like, you know what? I get getting submitted every single day. I went a, like a year without ever submitting anybody. Like after that, like every day I'd get submitted and never even come close to getting a submission. Wow. And yeah. And then later I realized it's because there's a small group. There's four guys. They're all better than me. And as I get better, they got better. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was just that whole, there was just, I just thought it was because I was just the worst <laughs> grappler yeah. in the history that's of mankind. Such, <laughs> that's such a common experience. And it's, it's especially, as you, as you point out, it's especially common in small clubs. You're getting mm-hmm. better, but everyone else is getting better too. And it's not until some new people show up and you, you stomp them that you realize, wait a second, wait, I, I don't suck after all. Yeah. Well, it's funny because then I'd been training with Egan for maybe a year or so. And then I, uh, with, I, I think I hadn't gone to the Machados for maybe eight months or something. And then I'm back in LA and I went to a class and I'm having a great time in class. And then he says, okay, now we're going to roll. I'm like, Oh, God, I'm not, oh, God, okay, here we go. I'm going to get creamed again. They put me with a white belt and, I armbarred him. That was my first armbar. I mean, my first armbar ever. Like, oh, man, how did that, what happened there? Then they put me with somebody else. I armbarred him. What? What's going on here? Then they put me with the blue belt. Like, oh, geez, here we go. But I passed his guard, and I didn't submit him or anything. But it's like, huh, it was very curious. But, yeah, all you guys out there that are training in jiu-jitsu, and, yeah, if you have a small group of people, um, you know, it's really important to train if you can. You train with people better than you, so you work on your defense. You train with people about the same, so you work on your flow and the whole continuity of the game. You work with people that you're better than, so you can work on your offense. So you need all those three. because. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in the end, you may train with guys much better than you, uh, and you should get into that offensive mindset anyway, even though you feel, you know you may not catch them you get in an offensive mindset so you don't just get defensive and you practice working that offense and, you know, little by little, everything gets tweaked and 
improved, even though you're not finishing anything or even maybe even getting all the way to something, you go with somebody not that good, bang, you get right to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be my advice on that. Well, at one point you were training not only with Egan, you're also training with uh, Shruta Verissimo and uh, uh, Barrett Yoshida as well, yes. right? Yeah, so I training with Egan. Uh, one day Egan says, hey, there's this uh, new guy at our school. He had left, uh, uh, Barrett had left the school he was training with again for some, yeah. They were basically somebody trained him at this other school and trained him for a particular fight against a guy from Brazil. And the guy who was training him bet on the other guy. Really? So a little conflict of interest. So anyway, Barrett, that was finally the straw that broke the camel's back. Barrett submitted that guy anyway. But uh, so Barrett comes over. I don't know who he is. And Egan says, hey, there's this guy. I think you really like to roll with him. I'm like, oh, cool. And so he goes, yeah, he's going to be here later. So here's this little guy, just like shy as shy can be, doesn't barely speaks at all, like barely speaks at all. And he's over in the corner. Egan's like, yeah, go ahead, go roll with him. So we're, we're going with Guy. And so I start in his guard, and he's very relaxed and, and all, and I grab his Guy pants, and my, you know, at that time, my number one Guy pass was the standing Tori on the pass, throwing mm-hmm. the legs pass. And so I got a good grip. I pat, got outside his feet. I was walking around his legs and I remember I'm walking all the way up to his head and I'm thinking, Oh, I'm going to pass his guard. And he had a purple belt on I'm like, Oh, and I was a blue belt. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to pass this guy's guard. Huh? I'm going to pass his guard. I'm putting my head down. As soon as I let go, he spun and triangled me. You know, he, he just had it set up the whole time. <laughs> He's just waiting for me to get, to let go. And then boom, he just spun and, put on a tightest triangle. I'm like, oh, how about that? So uh, I ended up getting to train uh, again, fortunately. You know what I did? Uh, I really appreciate training with really good people. So for me personally, instead of buying, I don't know, lavish things or spending money on going out to dinner or, or all this or vacations and all, I spend my extra money on private lessons. Fortunately, my mm-hmm. wife is good with that. So, <laughs> yeah, thank goodness. So I uh, trained uh, privately with Barrett. I was his first private student. And so you're talking about Shiruta Verissimo. And, I mean, he came and started training Egan for a while when Shiruta moved to Oahu. Because BJ Penn's in, on the big island, and Sharuta moved there and was training BJ. Then he moved over here for a little while. And so I had the great fortune of every single week I would roll with Egan, shorts, uh, not short, but stocky, very muscular, amazing technician, just like God, his technique is so precise. I would train with Sharuto uh, and roll with Sharuto, who's tall, lanky, very, got that no one yao game, even though he's tall. And then uh, roll with Barrett every week as well, who's just, you know, the phenom, does nothing but jiu-jitsu, amazing, amazing grappler. So that really helped improve my overall jiu-jitsu, of course. Um, But I would just go and train and train and train and get submitted and submitted and submitted and submitted and uh, end up getting to corner Barrett in three Abu Dhabis. Uh, one in Brazil, one in Long Beach, one in uh, New Jersey. Um, so I was able to get exposed to all these other guys and got to know. Like, I I was about 20 feet away from the mat. We were on, on deck when uh, Eddie Bravo triangled uh, Hoyler Gracie, mm-hmm. uh, which was kind of neat. I got to meet uh, – there's this little guy in our uh, – not little, but there's a – a very young, shy Brazilian guy in our um, uh, in our locker room, like the the waiting area, the warm up area. They had four different warm up areas, and in ours there was this real shy Brazilian guy. I remember seeing him. He's like, "Wow!" It turned out this is at the Brazil, the Abu Dhabi that was in Brazil. Turns out he had thrown at the last minute because somebody couldn't make it, and so they just found somebody in Sao Paulo to put in. Let me guess. Wait. Strong little short legs, black curly hair. Yeah. And a real affinity for the butterfly guard and the X guard. 
you, gosh, that is like you're reading my mind. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And I remember thinking, oh, this poor guy, his first fight, when I went out, I saw he's, you know, he's shaking hands with, with um, uh, Henzo. His first fight, he had to go fight Henzo. I'm like, oh, poor guy, right? Then I remember looking like, oh, gosh, he swept Henzo. Oh, wow, he's on Henzo's back. What in the world? So, yeah, and so fortunately I did get, I know we became friends, Marcelo Garcia and I. We got acquainted there and became friends at the next one, and then he came over here. So yeah, I, my approach to training jiu-jitsu as far as learning is I just go and train with the best people I can possibly train with wherever I can possibly do it. And uh, what's nice is you start to see corollaries. Or let's take the triangle, for example. I think it's a really good example. You learn the triangle from particular person, like say Barrett Yoshida, who's this this phenomenal triangle. Mm -hmm. You learn it from him and I get all the details, his details and this and that. Great. Then I'm learning the triangle from Shiruto and Shiruto says, Hey, flex your toes, pull your toes back. It makes your calf hard and it makes it, everything tightens up a little more. Oh wow. There's another detail. Then somebody else gives you another detail. Somebody else gives you this one detail you've never heard any place. And you know, you keep doing that you end up with, these details that all of a sudden, if you throw the triangle on somebody, they're not getting out of it. So, uh, yeah, just like, you know, it's the JTD concept. Let's go back to Bruce Lee for just a second. It, the idea is to train with whatever you can find, including different instructors, and you take the best of it. You know, you just take the very best of it, and it's just it's a mindset and it's actually a way of life. It's just you know, constantly looking to improve yourself and see what you can learn from these different great, uh, whether it's grapplers or kickboxers or clinch guy, you know, Greco Roman or whoever, just constantly looking, uh, to improve. Okay. Well, so you, you jumped down the jujitsu rabbit hole big time, clearly. Uh, how then do you, square the circle between the ju- training jiu-jitsu for the love of training jiu-jitsu and the sort of streetwise, uh, the streetwise aspects of it, using this art or using aspects of this art in the street or in a self-defense situation and how that ties in with, you know, the what about multiple opponents argument or the what about weapons or what about striking? How, how can one adapt one's grappling to be street proof yes that's well i think it's interesting that with me i did all these martial arts and it was all quote street you know it's like oh this is all for you know self-defense it's not that sports stuff and then when i really it really this is what i came to the realization and let me say right here in case anybody my instructor dan inasano i'm not saying he taught me wrong or anything like that because he told me and everybody else plenty of times, you know, you got to get your sparring in. You know, one competition is worth six months of training and all that. He said this all the time, but it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to actually grasp it and do what he said. But uh, what I came to realize is that I was not a functional kickboxer. I was not functional in the clinch. I was not functional in weaponry. I was not functional on the ground. So, wow. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I uh, just said, you know what? I'm not going to teach any seminars. All that stuff I was teaching for all those years and doing seminars, like 40-some seminars a year, I just told everybody I'm not doing that anymore. If you want to have me out for a seminar, I'm not showing any of that stuff anymore. I'm only going to show you the things I know for a fact works because I or someone I know has done it under real pressure. And so I... Um, went way into the sports side because I knew it worked. Then years and years later, when I really was very comfortable in all the ranges and I was having good success with good people. I'm sorry, sorry. Let's just jump back here a second. When you said went into the sports side, you meant, for example, kickboxing against somebody who's really trying to punch your head in as well and grappling against somebody who's really trying to armbar you as well. Is that what you mean by sports side? Yes. So, okay. Uh, the aspect of actually competing, having someone really trying to do it to you, getting really good people. So it was kickboxing, MMA, 
uh, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and, you know, some wrestling also and uh, clinch and such. So after doing that for years, it came back, uh, I mean, you know, okay, my students are doing well. I am very comfortable and this and that. Like, you know, my original thing was self-defense. And I just decided, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and delve into that again. So instead of starting and going, here are the techniques that we have, you know, we can grab the throat, we can hit them in the groin, blah, 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 all this stuff, I, you know. Then I said, okay, now I know what I'm doing. <laughs> now let me look at it again. And because yeah, we all know that there are a lot of, like, you know, a lot of traditional martial artists that just don't know how to fight at all. And they right. think they do, and they'll look at the sport and say, ah, that's no good. Look, you know, you just hit them in the groin, blah, blah, blah. It's just not true. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that wonderful clip of the Dim Mok Chinese Kung Fu master fighting this MMA uh, guy. And, yeah, uh, yeah the, the guy's busy throwing his students around without touching them, and then the next thing you know, he gets demolished. Uh, it, it's just the best example, and especially since that MMA guy, he was not... He was no high-level guy or anything. He was just some guy that, yeah, yeah, it was a great example. So that's why I went toward the sports side. It's like, okay, I know this works. And when I wanted to go back to self-defense, I just built everything around that base first. And then I said, it was very, I mean, it's it's so simple. Just go, okay, we're going to do, you know, Greco-Roman MMA, not not Greco-Roman for the sport of Greco-Roman, but for the MMA version. I trained with Randy Couture for years and a little bit with Matt Lindland and a lot with a guy named Robert Follis, who was the head coach at Team Quest. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's take that kind of clinch, and now we're going to either try to throw knees to the groin or I'm going to hit to the groin with my hand. Okay, well, guess what? The structure changes. <laughs> But still the elements, the basic elements are there. The underhook is there, the snap downs and the sweeps and the you know, move, arm drag to the back. Everything's still there, but you just make little adjustments. Then I made the adjustment of, hey, you know, we have to deal with weapons. And this is on the ground as well, like uh, jiu-jitsu-wise. Uh, you know, you take the MMA uh, with the striking and all. And for self-defense, we prior, you know, priorities are different. Imagine if you're training jiu-jitsu for a jiu-jitsu match. Once you have somebody in your guard, you have certain priorities where you're going to get your grip, where you're going, you know, where you're gripping and such. If you change that to no gi, okay, your grips are going to change. You have different priorities. You change it to MMA, it's really going to change because now you have to control posture uh, so you don't get smashed in the face. Then you change it to the to street situation, your priority becomes stand up as quickly as you possibly can in a lot of situations. So that's why I trained with uh, a former UFC fighter, Nate Corey. He was one of the Team Quest guys. Nate is awesome at standing up. He, mm-hmm. His skill at getting off the bottom is so amazing because I'll just tell you a funny story. Because he trained with Randy Couture and all those guys and Lindlin at Team Quest, people would come up to him. This is what he told me. People would come up to him and say, gosh, you must have great takedowns. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm getting taken down constantly. I don't have great takedowns. What I have is I'm great at getting off the bottom because I'm always on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so you learn, you know, so you prioritize it different. And then we add uh, at any time someone can draw a training knife. So we have put training knives on guys. So you're in there in your role, Maybe you sweep the guy, you get to the top, and ooh, here comes a knife. So you have, you have to always be looking for someone to draw a knife, so especially if you guys out there that are training jujitsu. If you have to use it in a self-defense situation, if you take someone down and mount them, that's when they may flip out and pull their, their knife that you didn't know they had. Mm-hmm. So we just have to always be, be aware and just always expect a weapon. You always expect a weapon. So guess what? Guess how I came up with a, uh, a different, different techniques and all that work very well under real pressure. Just put a training knife in a guy's hand said, here, you know, just try to hit me as hard as you can with that thing and slash thrust. Just do your best. Do whatever you possibly can. And, you know, it evolves over the years. You know, just evolves and evolves and evolves and evolves till we have something that works quite well. I, I think so, you've uh, just ruined my punchline, but uh, I was once training at my jiu-jitsu club, and I'd just come back from a Daniel Asanto seminar, 
And one of the things I picked up was a little uh, karambit, which is a curved Indonesian knife, which you hold in an ice pick grip, which has got a ring around your finger. So it's almost impossible to disarm, like virtually impossible without breaking the guy's finger off. And one guy in class was like, oh, you just went and did that silat thing, eh? Show me a silat counter to the triangle. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I go back to my bag and I, I hide this knife in my, uh, this training knife, dull knife. Uh -huh. in my gi, and I let him put the triangle on. He had a really good triangle. And I, <laughs> while he's there, I take this knife out, and I start, you know, there's this femoral artery, there's this other femoral artery, there's in the armpit, there's in the throat, there's in the stomach. There, And he, there was just this look of dull shock for about <laughs> five to ten seconds. Like, I had no idea what was going on. It's like, well, that would be a, a Silat person's most likely answer <laughs> to... Uh, to being caught in a triangle choke and you know, not playing by the rules of the situation that got them into that triangle choke in the first place. So exactly. I, I, that, I don't think that, I, I made a convert that day, but I was amused and that's the important thing. <laughs> that is amusing to me, but you know, again, that's the truth. You know, and if somebody's not ready to go outside, you know, we tend to think, you know, it happens in our, okay, if we're going to talk a little bit of like politically or whatever, People in our country that's developed with all these rules and, it's, you know, there's all these laws that people go by, they think everybody else and the rest of the world does that too. You know, oh, we should just tell them, that we're, you, know, we, you know, we're sorry about this or that or whatever when they've been trying to kill each other for the last 5,000 years. Um, you know, it's like we're in this set of rules. Well, guess what? Somebody else might be playing totally outside that. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little sideline. I think you'll find this interesting and I think everybody listening will. There was a, a group of guys that went down, they were researchers, and they went to Indonesia and years and years ago, and they were looking for technique, and they were asking guys in these different villages about knife technique. They wanted to see, you know, they were thinking knife disarm and how, you know, how you take a knife away from somebody. And they asked this one guy, and he says, oh, he thinks a little bit. He goes, yeah, I have a knife technique. Works every time. And they're like, wow, works every time? I said, well, what is it? He goes, well, what you do with the person, you know, the other guy? you have to know what he likes, like a book. Maybe he likes a book. And so you get a book and you go give him the book and then you hide the knife, your other hand, underneath the book. And when he grabs it, you stab him. <laughs> <laughs> there's your knife technique. <laughs> yeah, there's your cultural shift. That, uh... Yeah, totally different well, uh, point of view on things. Yeah. I don't... I don't actually, in my experience, it doesn't take that much. Like, it's not like you have to throw knives into every single jiu-jitsu training session to become sensitized no. to that. If you do that once every 10 times or get, you know, train jiu-jitsu with getting punched in the head, even, I mean, I guess any time is better than no time. If you've done it a couple of times, it's like going to a tournament, a tournament being, or one competition being worth six months of training. One sparring session that's completely outside the norm of what you're used to is also sometimes worth six months of training. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. It doesn't have to be all the time, but if you're thinking, uh, I mean, we love jujitsu, right? I mean, I just finished that train for two hours with these guys. It was just great. I mean, it's kind of fun. One guy's in his late 30s. The other guy's 19. Here I am in my 50s, and we just train and go at it for two hours and have that wonderful thing. But if you're thinking self-defense, if you think you would like to be able to use your jiu-jitsu for self-defense someday, it's very wise that every once in a while, just every once in a while, throw a knife into the mix and see what happens there, or just so you're aware of uh, what can actually happen for real. The, the lawyer in me feels compelled to point out that throw a dull knife into there, please. Boy, thank you very much. Put extremely safe, what we use is actually a padded small padded knife so it's quite safe and of course the person wielding the knife is careful not to injure in any way his partner uh so when i test things i test it at very high intensity levels but when we're training it's at a lower intensity level because first thing to me is like yeah i'm training this stuff for self-defense so i wouldn't get hurt uh, how do you uh, get hurt uh training self-defense <laughs> <laughs> so safety first yeah well, Burton, if people do want to train self-defense with you without getting too badly hurt, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? You know, uh, I do have distance learning 
programs uh, on DVD. I have some like, straight just stick fighting, just knife uh, DVDs. I have the empty hand program as well. And I'm going to be coming out, uh, I'm actually going to start shooting in a few months, a DJJ for the street. It'll be a program for specifically for street self-defense for for BJJ, and uh, I think it'll be very interesting for all you guys training jujitsu because it'll show you how to tweak it every once in a while. So you have that as well, tweak the training, I should say. So you're like, okay, well, we're going to do this a little bit, and we're going to do that a little bit, and uh, it's really, really interesting to me. Actually, the way you can set up. I, a lot easier to set up things uh, when you can grab a guy's throat, like the old that hip bump sweep when you you're in you have a guy on your guard and he sits back and you sit up and bump him over with your hip. Boy, it's sure easy to get those guys to sit back when you grab them by the throat first and start pushing. Interesting. So, yeah, it's just yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting deal. But uh, yeah, and I travel also. I do seminars and uh, so if you like, you can always contact me at. Uh, jkdunlimited.com or uh, if you want a referral, just let me know. I'll put you in touch with someone in your area if, if I know somebody or whatever I can do to help. I just want to help everybody enjoy their training. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to chat with me today. And I, I, I really enjoyed this chat and I, I think my listeners will also uh, get a lot out of it. So thank you so much yeah. and good luck with your training and teaching. Well, thank you, Stefan, and uh, yeah, I just really appreciate what you've done. You've really uh, done a wonderful job getting top-level technique and training methods out to people, so thank you for that. Podcast listeners, if you're listening, there's a good chance that you're into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I hope that you are. It's the best martial art out there, but nevertheless, if you do Jiu-Jitsu, if you do grappling, if you do MMA, I've got a book out there. It's called A Roadmap to BJJ, and it covers the fundamentals of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It covers the techniques and the positions. It's got checklists. It's a super useful resource, and it's completely free. If you go to grapplearts.com forward slash book, you can download it. It's also on Amazon Kindle where you can buy it if you want to go that way, but I'm going to suggest the free route, which is grapplearts.com slash book. Check it out. I get feedback almost every day from people who found this super useful in finally getting through and understanding the ground game and it finally making sense for them and it finally not being so intimidating anymore. Check it out. I think you'll find it really useful too. Wow.